So that's just to let you know that we're, we're recording this. Um, so Brave New World, the first session that we had was October 15th, and that was about safe reopening. And Michael Donovan from Missouri Arts Council talked about the Missouri Art Safe Certification Program, which is a great program to kind of ensure your patrons and guests and to help you feel more comfortable with, you know, being a, a, a venue that's um, doing their best in this situation. So I would encourage you to check that out. That video is actually already up on our YouTube page. Um, and then last week we had a nice discussion about the legal aspects of producing and performing virtually, which was really interesting. So we are working to get that link up. And then today, of course, we're talking about creative possibilities, um, creative and technical possibilities um, in having to pivot and kind of live and work in this virtual world. So um, we have a series of panelists today and the way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna introduce each panelist. Um, they're gonna talk for about five minutes and just kind of how they've had to pivot. Um, and that'll take the first half of the session. And then we're gonna open it up for Q and A. So if you have questions or if you'd like to um, ask somebody or if the panelists would like to kind of discuss, um, there's lots of different things that we talked about leading up to this and preparing for this. So we hope you find this informative. Um, so do feel free to join in that Q&A. Also, I just wanna point out, I put um, the survey, now that the three sessions will be over today, I put the survey for the whole series up in the chat and I will also send it to everybody who's registered by email. So um, I'll put it up again at the end of the session today. So we'd love to get your feedback, including other topics that you'd like to see us address. So we thank you for joining us. And there's a question, are previous sessions available to share via email? Yes, once I get those up on our MU Extension Community Arts YouTube page, then I will have a YouTube link and I can just send that around to everybody. So yes, I'll send those out, Diane, okay? So um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our first presenter and let me remove my, my spotlight. Our first presenter is going to be, let me spotlight her, Karen Paisley. And Karen is the founding artistic director of Metropolitan Ensemble Theater in Kansas City. She's a professional theater director, performer, teacher, and playwright. Um, she's founded the Casey Playwriting Intensive, now in its fourth year, serving writers from America, Canada, and Germany. She's done other initiatives um, about science and playwriting and, and all kinds of other things. So she's gonna talk today and I'm gonna turn it over to Karen. Okay, thank you. I'm really, really thrilled to be here with all of you. Um, I guess first things first, you know, running a professional theater during a pandemic is nobody's idea of a good time. Um, it's been pretty stark. Uh, we closed in March. And so the first thing to do was just secure the theater um, both, I guess, from a physical standpoint and a financial standpoint. Um, then we began to think about how can we survive and keep making art in some kind of way. Uh, we started out doing live stream music with varying degrees of success. First try, totally tanked. Sounded great in the building. And then internet snapped food and it simply didn't work. So we improved it. Um, the second band that came in had a dynamite time and really went well. The third band also then, um, internet was sketchy. And so some people got a great experience, some people didn't. This led us to kind of go, no more live streaming because we simply don't have control of the product at that point. Um, and feeling that the audience experience needs to continually be um, positive and really enjoyable. Um, over time, we started partnering with another group of people, Venture Out Theater, um, directing a play that I had been interested in producing on our season, and then this little company got born. So I gave them the play. I directed it with them. Uh, we started out rehearsing outside. So everything we've done through the entire pandemic has been kind of taken first through the prism of safety and safety first. Um, Rehearsals went well outside uh, until it got to be about 96 degrees, and then it was a little much. Then it began to rain. These two things kind of were lessons. So at that point, we all moved inside the Warwick Theater, which is our home base. 
Um, the Warwick is a really vast building with 27 foot ceilings, about a good 8,000 square feet performing space. So there's a lot of room. We continued our social distancing, masking, et cetera. So we kind of created a bubble for ourselves um, that we were all five in during this time and committed to that um, with also the understanding that if it started to go badly, we would just stop. And I think that was key to the process. Um, I have to raise my hand for a question because I'm hearing a lot of static. Can you tell me whether or not you hear me? I can hear you just fine. You're loud and clear, Karen. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, to return to the story, we resumed our rehearsals. Twice we stopped. Once when the daughter of one of our actresses um, had an employee at her job become diagnosed with COVID. So we all hit the pause button waiting for the test to come back for her daughter, which meant that was negative. Then Kathy would be negative. None of us were exposed and we resumed rehearsals. So on two occasions during two months, we did this. Um, meanwhile, we worked on our safety plan for the Warwick so we could have really, really strict protocols for safety for our audience, which were designed with CDC, OSHA, and a really wonderful organization called the Event Safety Alliance, which is a collection of about 400 organizations. So collectively, all that input came into the plan. We ultimately wound up coming inside and doing four live performances for extremely small audiences that observed all the safety protocols. Um, first audience was five, second audience was 13, then we swelled to a massive 18, and then decreased to a substantial 10 people in the audience. Um, I have to say though, that I consider this a pretty significant success because had there been a lot of people, it would have been frightening to try to do this for the first time. Um, all audiences were masked, um, temperatures were taken before events were given to the audience to enter the building. The COVID questionnaire occurred for every single person. And we have records of everyone who attended their temperature on that day, their sign off to these things and so forth. All seats were reserved to ensure that we did this. I think the thing that really made this a standout experience was that having had the experience with live stream, we included a cinematographer in the process who joined us probably um, two weeks out from opening and began to attend our rehearsals. The play was being directed and thrust, so it was lit from three sides with a lot of backlight, which allowed him to film it from lots of different angles. So he came to rehearsals, and then as we moved into dress rehearsal process, he was there for that, and then filmed the play in its entirety at various locations in the room, um, close-ups, traveled with the actors and crosses. So the whole outcome for the video on demand component is beautiful. I was really thrilled artistically with what that looked like. And we got great feedback, both from the in-person audience and the video on demand audience. But I think the partnership and the collaboration with a filmmaker was what really made it possible for filming a play to be artistically exciting. It wasn't simply park your video cameras in various corners of the room and then just hope for the best. That his artistry captured our artistry. And I wasn't asked to reblock anything. I didn't have to redo light cues. Um, all the sound worked. Um, I think the audiences that wrote us back really were thrilled with the experience. Um, so much so that if you turned off the lights in your room and you were watching it, you kind of felt like you were at the theater. And that was really exciting. Um, from an economic standpoint, um, this did not make money. There were not enough audience members to cover the costs. However, I did the math this morning, and had we had 15 more people at the four in-person performances, and we had ample seating to have done that. The Warwick seats 311 plus, and had about 60 more people in the video on demand, the play would have broken even, which to me is pretty important in the long term. So there you are for the quick and dirty, and if you want more information, tag me back later.
Thank you so much, Karen. That I appreciate that. Um, and we'll save questions for each of these panelists. We'll let each panelist speak, and then we'll open up questions to any or all of the panelists once each has spoken. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to our next panelist, and that is Katina Batsikas. And I'm going to spotlight her for everyone. And I'm actually going to, um, she's going to uh, share with her, Katina is a digital storytelling professor at uh, University of Missouri down in Columbia. She's the assistant professor and coordinator for the digital storytelling program in the School of Visual Studies at MU. But she's also a video artist who works in photography, performance, and sculpture. Themes of her work include grief, trauma, and mental health. Her works have been shown both internationally and nationally in museums, galleries, and film festivals. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Katina and she will, um, she will share with you. Thank you. All right, everybody, I'm just going to share my screen real fast with you. Hopefully y'all can see that okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Katina, Thank you. We, we have one person that's calling in today, so you might want to kind of describe yep. this as you're showing yeah, no worries. Um, so thank you so much for having me, um, Lisa and GK. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of go through a little bit about what the process has been like as a working, um, I mean, I, I'm a professor as well, but also a working artist. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through a little bit how COVID has changed, um, um, you know, somebody working in video and um, within the art world. So um, when COVID first hit, um, many of the film festivals um, that I'd already been accepted to and film um, festival events that were already planned had obviously been canceled. And most um, had moved online to this online screening platform. And so I'm just, these, these are just like representative in, image of one of the um, online platforms. This was a film festival um, in Korea where actually they um, typically for their festival, there's 10 selected artists and they have, um, actually installed within the forest that's on the grounds of their um, venue is where they show these films. But of course, because of COVID, they had to move it um, online. And um, most of these festivals, well, some of them, they still will charge the normal sort of like screening fee in order to view them. Some of them though, like this festival actually was free for people to view it, but you could only view it for that one week period that the festival was running. Um, so this one, if you go to their website now, it's only a still image of the work that you can see. You can't actually watch my video um, anymore. Um, some other venues um, such as this exhibition um, at University of Connecticut, Avery Point, which is actually a beautiful, um, it's right on the water. They have like um, lighthouses and, and whatnot. Um, and this beautiful kind of already made uh, sort of sculpture park right on the water. And so this exhibition was actually created in response to COVID and the need to create outdoor exhibitions. And like, so what does that mean, right? How do we create, um, how do we take gallery programming outside of the gallery, right? Um, to a, um, you know, outdoor live venue. So what they chose to do was they had, they created an exhibition called Open Air by Day and Open Air by Night. Mine was part of the Open Air by Night program. Um, and so the by day program was site specific sculptures that were created um, to be installed actually on the, um, on the grounds that people could, um, you know, socially distance walk around. And then the by night program was um, people like myself who are video artists that would actually projection map um, like this onto the onto the lighthouse itself. Um, so our videos were all displayed for people to come at night then and socially distance be able to see um, these. So it's just kind of interesting to see how some of that programming has transferred um, into like an outdoor space um, for people to see in a safe way. Um, I wanted to actually for the rest of my time kind of focus on um, a specific work and how it's been translated through the pandemic. Um, so this specific um, work actually um, was first shown this is a uh, satellite art fair in New York and it was shown as a large projection and it was actually created um, as a performance for the camera. And so a recorded performance that was then shown as a 
piece of art that was screened to an audience, right? Much like a, much like a film festival. Um, so this was the original intention of the work, right? For me to just make the performance, record it, and then show it at a later date. These are just some stills from that. Um, and then this work was supposed to be shown um, in the same sort of way, um, projected in a gallery. This was at University of Kentucky. Um, they have a, a show called Homeless Situation and it was supposed to be an in-person show um, where my work would also be projected at this venue along with other artists working in many different mediums. However, the show itself, their actual gallery at University of Kentucky was transferred or was um, repurposed into uh, uh, temporary classrooms. So nobody's actually using the gallery at all um, because they have to use it as um, larger classroom space for students so that they can be distanced. Um, so that posed for the curator, um, Becky, who's actually also a collaborator of mine, um, posed an issue, right? So how do we take this exhibition and then um, what do we do with it? So she made an online, um, online gallery for the exhibition instead, um, where it's kind of beautifully laid out and then people can at their leisure kind of scroll through this. So again, um, so every artist then has their own page like this that you see. And so here you can actually view my video and then read obviously my artist statement about that. And then um, here you can click on all the different artists to then see you know, what, um, what their work would actually look like. So obviously it's different than being a gallery space, but you still get the idea of curation around one common theme and how these works are all being shown in context of each other. So then this piece kind of shifted. So I was thinking about this, this work and what this work meant. And so in this work, what I'm doing is I'm actually, um, I'm, I'm, I'm walking, but I'm walking in a way in which I'm using my feet as, as units of measurement. And so I, am, I'm, I measured both the space of my own house. So I walked on all the different floor coverings and, and used my feet as rulers um, to measure my own domestic space. And then also the domestic space of my mother and then my grandmother, obviously pre-pandemic. Um, and that's what the original video was. So I started to think about, okay, well, what does, what does the space mean? What do our dwellings mean in this time when we were spending so much more time in our own dwellings? Um, so I had this idea to create this into a virtual live performance event where I would invite people to um, use Zoom much as we are now, but use it on their cell phones facing down in that same sort of position like this of their feet. And then they would do this same action at the same time in unison with me, um, creating that sense of unity in somewhat isolating spaces, right? So, um, so this piece was first um, shown or performed, I guess you could say, um, for a conference that's out of Toronto called Our Networks. It's actually a, a digital media conference um, that they have live performances to. Um, it was successful. I didn't have as many participants as I would like this first time, um, but it was still interesting to see how people were, um, you know, measuring their spaces and um, the, some of the comparisons between my domestic setting and theirs. Um, this piece was then um, performed again. Um, and the interesting thing about this time was there were um, this was in collaboration with with Bond Festival, um, and that's out of actually out of China. Um, and so the interesting thing about this was it was myself and a few other people from America, and then half of the other people were from China. And so listen, so comparing their floor coverings, right, and their domestic spaces to um, American domestic spaces, but how we're also in a shared experience of the pandemic when we're completely across the other side of the world, right? Um, and so also is interesting too, because part of the performance is you announce how many steps and what room you're, you're then entering into. And so to hear the different languages too, because some of them um, weren't English um, speakers, uh, that was pretty interesting to hear as well during the performance. Um, and so the, the difference with this performance is that not everybody was invited um, to perform. There were pre-set performers from both here in China, and then it was live streamed on Twitch and then a bunch of other Chinese streaming sites. Um, and actually like 4,000 people ended up watching the stream, which was kind of cool. So this is just some stills from what this looked like um, in Zoom, right? So how 
this sort of performance had been translated from when I originally did it as a recorded performance to um, how this looks as like a collaborative, a collaborative um, Zoom performance when I don't have control or much control outside of giving instructions to the actual performers. Um, and then uh, this will be done actually I, one more time or maybe more, who knows, but um, this coming fall, yes, sorry, this coming fall. Um, so there's another gallery called um, Radio D Gallery, which is out of Brooklyn. Um, and so I'm going to be doing this virtually again um, this fall. And then the cool thing about this though, is then the artifacts from this, this next time that I'm doing it will then be shown in at Radiator Gallery um, sometime next year when it's safe to have a distance show. Um, so that's kind of just, I want to talk about how that came full circle. And um, the other interesting thing though, to, again, relating to the full circle is that this show that's opening this weekend actually is now my first show since the pandemic starts, it actually has um, an in-person, is an in-person show. So I actually shipped the photographs for this show. Um, this is in Be uh, Beacon, um, sorry, Beacon, New York, Ethan, Co Ethan Cohen Gallery. Um, and it's, it's, it's all um, by appointment only with face masks. So it's interesting now it sounds like, it seems like some galleries are starting to now go back to the in-person, but just with really great, um, um, you know, social distancing and um, PPE requirements um, in place. So that's kind of just wanted to give you um, an overview Thanks, kind of how that one piece transformed. So. Thanks, Katina. That was great. Um, and if you could make me host again so I can. Yep. Yep. Sorry, one second. <laughs> that was really interesting. Um, and it's interesting, the next panelist, Michael Gaines, also works in a gallery space. So it will be interesting to kind of see how, um, how these two individuals have done different things and different, you know, different ways that you can work with the gallery space. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Michael Gaines. He has been the executive director of the Hannibal Arts Council since 1993. Throughout his 27 years in one community, Michael has witnessed great growth in the arts, which is now at the forefront of the community. Since 2005, he served as executive director of the Missouri Association of Community Arts Agencies, known as MACA, um, which is a statewide art service organization providing technical assistance and professional development to Missouri's community arts agencies. MACA is a network of leaders serving small rural nonprofit organizations to metropolitan arts commissions and everything in between. So Michael, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm gonna make you host so that you can share your screen. And there you go. All right, I'll share it in a minute. Thank you. Uh, really quickly, I just wanna say thanks for including me in the call. Um, but I go back to our, our journey is like my statewide job is one aspect of what I do, but I think I'm gonna speak to you mostly from the Hannibal Arts Council perspective. Um, which is a small rural arts agency. Uh, to look at like mid-March, we did a program, the next day we closed uh, for weeks, as most of you uh, have. But one thing that we did is we started immediately um, organizing. Um, I've got 25 years of files that needed to be cleaned out. So, so taking that time to um, organize over, yeah, 10 to 12,000 files, um, organize all of our archives and doing all that. We took advantage of that time um, to kind of regroup and kind of catch up. Then the next step that we did, and, and we're a gallery, we're a nonprofit community arts agency. So we do have a gallery, but we're not defined by our building. So being community-based, when we get on through the months of what we've done, we've been able to Kind of do some different things that I'll explain later. Um, but after we got done, I guess, organizing and just kind of getting through the shock of being kind of closed now the office, we looked at what do we have now that we can continue with, with changes uh, virtually and did an assessment there. Um, and then later on, we looked at how can we can we, how can we transition some of our programs uh, into in-person or how can we get back to in-person? We are open now um, and are doing programs. Then I'll explain how we're changing them. 
And then, you know, we're creative people. So like everyone else that's spoken is like, what can we, what can we create? What's something new we could do uh, that we haven't done before because we all are creative. So I'm gonna try a screen share here. Okay. So just getting into the first thing, we, we thought it was like, oh, we have a program where we put artwork into a, a local clinic. Uh, so we thought, okay, a lot of people, unfortunately, are going to be going to the clinic. Um, our people are still going there for health care. Uh, so we made sure we, we kind of re-promoted it. It's not something, since our gallery was closed, we really re-tagged it as our satellite gallery and continued exhibits there. And that worked out really well um, because it was going under the protocols of the clinic and people could still see the artwork. We could still promote it online and it'd still be a program that we're continuing to do. So that was, that was one. Um, pretty much immediately, um, we have a lot of, we have a photography show that we do that is really no contact. Um, people are sending in uh, photographs of their work and we put it on a what's called a photography channel which is a 55 inch television in our gallery so since we were close to the public we just took the same concept but translated it to visual artists of you know painters uh, sculptors whatever they're doing to submit their images uh, to us via email again no contact we created a, an online exhibit, put it on our website, put it on our Facebook page, and had hundreds and hundreds of, of views, which is more than what we would honestly have in an in-person gallery <laughs> situation. Um, I'm trying to get to the next slide here, but this is in the way. Sorry. Um, this is kind of fast forwarding to August. Uh, where we were, you know, we are open to the public, but what we continued was, you notice the online um, option as well. And that really, again, has worked, worked really well. We continued a photography channel. Um, and then the in-person, if you notice something we did um, at the very bottom with the three asterisks, gallery visitors will be asked to abide by HAC occupancy limits and practice physical distancing. We all along have not used the word social distancing. Uh, we've used physical distancing because we can still be social just far apart. <laughs> and so that semantic uh, for us has really worked well because there's a psychological aspect to social distancing. And it's really, I don't know, that's just something I share with you that we've done that's kind of been important um, to us. And, then, and another thing that's here, if you look at the bottom, sponsored by, well, you see my name. So um, sponsorship, by doing it online and limited in person, we're still able to engage our sponsors. We're still able to get income uh, and revenue from sponsors, which has been, you know, invaluable. A new thing we did, that looks like that's October. We started this in September. Uh, two other galleries in town, the Alliance Art Gallery and Gallery 310, uh, our collaborative galleries. We haven't always participated with them in what's called Second Saturday um, Gallery Night, which is a short time period evening event. Well, we all expanded it to a longer time period so that we did have visitors are not congested together in a short period of time. So that's an, a great collaboration and it's been really successful um, as well. So that's just a program idea, kind of low tech. Another option we had was take an exhibit off site. It's one that's going on now. We took it to a huge exhibit space, go by all protocols um, and have had you know, quite good success uh, with that exhibit out of our gallery and that's worked well. Um, another example of something we did, we was like, oh, you know what? We have all these t-shirts. Uh, we could do, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Somebody could come by, pick up a t-shirt, take it home, design it, send it in, and we could do a contest. So when we did the ones for um, ages four to 12, we actually had 1,100 people vote 
um, on the contest. I mean, we're a town of 18,000. So having that many people engage in a contest, it was again, like very little contact. You know, one parent comes in, picks up a t-shirt, take it home, uh, submit it again via email. We did the voting on our website and also on Facebook and that engaged, you know, a hundred kids, but then with the voting, and again, it's keeping our logos right there. So those 1100 votes, those, you know, 500 shares resulted in our name still being out there all the time. Um, then we did, yeah, that one. And another important thing, we were still able to engage sponsors. We actually made money on the project, even with presenting awards. So that was another important thing. Again, keeping our members engaged and our sponsors engaged. Um, next one's an example of a kids program where again, not being defined by our building, we took it to um, an event venue called The Orchard. Um, we limited number, it's outside, everyone was masked, it worked great. And again, you see the sponsors, foundations, General Mills, um, so again, still doing programming, but very limited. Another new thing we've done is take and make. Um, again, these are very, very everyday kind of programming, but it's creating supply kits uh, for parents to come in and pick up for their kids. And whereas we would normally have 80 kids to 100 kids in the room doing the project, um, they're just picking up a really cool project kit, take it home. Again, sponsors are there. We're having more participation actually with make, take and make than in person, which is awesome. We did the same thing uh, for an upcoming existing program. The only thing we did differently is we added the, added the to go. And again, it's six projects uh, being picked up in a project kit, in a bag, that come in, take it home, do it, send us pictures of their finished product. And that works, that's worked, is gonna work really well. We already have, I think 30 of those kits reserved and we have till the 20th of November to do that. Um, we have a program called Artie Party. Uh, we've just limited the number, spread out the tables. Um, everyone's masked, again, physically distanced. So we're able to continue those programs. Whereas normally we would have been selling out at 35 people and we've sold them out for a year and a half to two years. We're now limiting, limiting those to um, 12 to 15 people. Um, another thing that's easy low tech is we still presented our volunteer awards. Um, we did them not at a ceremony. We just went individually to each winner, uh, gave them their award and shared that again, social media, Keep our name out there. Keep our name out there constantly, um, really. <laughs> and then being able to do things graphically online uh, with just promoting those. And again, so many shares and so many likes. And 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 it, if we just done it as an in-person award ceremony, it would have been 50 people, but now it's hundreds. And again, logos right there, our names out there, multiple times a week. Um, then I just clicked random kind of shares. Um, who's on our board? Um, who's the staff? Like easy reminders using social media and our website to, again, keep our name out there, keep our visibility up this whole time. Um, and then really quickly, I think I'm almost to the end. Yeah. One, oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just, bah. it's okay. So exciting. I mean, because I feel like I've been proud of us because we really have done well of keeping our name out there and keeping visibility and programs just changed. One important thing was communicating with our members and that's a, a double down campaign I created um, back in July when we thought, oh yeah, new fiscal year, what can we do? And we canceled a, an event that was $35,000 net profit so I made a goal to raise actually $30,000, $40,000. We raised $40,000 in two weeks. And that covered the cost of that event being canceled. Uh, when you're doing programming that your community values and are engaged with, um, I feel like that's when you can raise $40,000 in two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. So our community really stepped up there. 
And then all along too, I remind people of our future. Um, you know, they wanna see us at the other side of all of this. So the vision fund was really important. And a result of this kind of doing like we literally two weeks ago received a $400,000 gift, a living gift and one that is coming with no strings that's gonna allow our organization to do, um, to keep going. Uh, so I feel financially, our Hannibal Arts Council has been successful in, it's not using, using this, but being transparent and being communicative with our membership and our community. So all of those are very, as we talked about on the pre-call, like low tech, just everyday kind of things that we've done that have been successful. So I share those with you. Thank you, Michael. That was great. And um, if you can I'll stop share. sharing your screen and, and if you can make me host again, then I will Let's see if I can do go that. on. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And more and make host. So um, our last speaker, thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate that. Our last speaker um, on the panel, and then we will open it up for, we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, Anna Joy Walker is gonna be our next speaker, and I will go ahead and highlight her there. Hi, Anna Joy. So Anna Joy um, is the Executive and Strategic Relations Manager at Arts KC Regional Arts Council. She grew up in the Pacific Northwest, um, which she says is arguably one of the most beautiful places on the planet. But after a 20 plus year storied affair with the strange Midwest culture, she is officially a hybrid transplant. She's passionate about humans, art, justice, and a meta narrative that spans millennia. She spends her time dreaming with people, championing them, and finding creative ways to access otherwise unknown paths to resources, building what she calls a constellation of connection. And that's a super great segue into her talk. So without further ado, here's Anna Joy. Hi, thank you so much, Lisa and GK. Um, I I have post-its. I just was like scribbling post-it notes while Michael was talking and um, and while uh, Katina was talking because I'm inspired and excited. And Karen and I go way back, so I already know what she's doing. Um, I already have like a section of post-its with all of my notes with Karen. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, so I have, oh wait, I actually have myself a timer because I'm notoriously bad at knowing how long I speak. So there we go. And I'm gonna just run through, oh yeah. I'm gonna run through um, a few things that uh, we are doing and have done in our sort of pivoting of uh, programming. And I would even say uh, projects, uh, from programming to projects, um, it's a, it's an it's an interesting thing that's happening right now uh, that I don't think we were expecting. So, um, Arts KC, if if you are not familiar, we are the Regional Arts Council for the Greater Metropolitan Area of Kansas City. So we serve five counties in the in the region, three in Missouri, two in Kansas. And our goal is to promote, support, and advocate the arts and to unleash the power of the arts in the region. And we've historically done that. We've been around for about 20 plus, about 21 years, I think now is our, we're in our 21st year. And uh, we've done that over the years through, I would say heavy programming. Um, we have a couple of stalwart programs that have been around for quite a while as a service to the community. But in the in, in recent years, um, Dana Knapp, who is our current president and CEO, when she took the helm a few years ago, she really uh, began, began the process of just being incredibly strategic in building relationships cross sector in order to um, sort of create a constellation of connections. So, rather than just within the arts org universe or artist universe that can sometimes be a little two-dimensional or like linear um she's really been building these uh connections with uh you know like health uh, workforce development uh city city municipalities staff representatives uh, we have a really robust advocacy committee 
that is what I call frothy. These people just keep putting work on our plate and we're like, okay. Um, and so just like really growing our, the, I would say the influence of the art universe in, in Kansas City. And since honestly, since COVID and the shutdown happened and utilizing um, Zoom and other online resources, it's actually been broadening throughout the state of Missouri and Kansas more than we've had access to in the past, which is exciting. So anyway, uh, there's a couple of things that I wanted to touch on. Uh, like I said, we, we've kind of, we have our programs, but since COVID, there's been this mm, activation of projects. Uh, and there's a couple of that we're really working on. I would say that we're not innovating necessarily like the virtual universe or technology. There's, we're not specifically innovating that. What we are innovating is relationships and we are innovating collaborations, which I'm personally really excited about. Um, so we, uh, my, my personal baby of projects is called the listens project, uh, it came out of a, an encounter I had with a piece of art by a friend of mine, uh, at the beginning of the George Floyd marches. Um, and it was so impactful to me that I just had to stop and ask myself, what do I have? What can I give to this, to this thing? And my answer was, oh, I have an arts organization. It's not my arts organization, but you know, and we have a platform, we have an audience and our audience can be used to, our, our platform can be used to amplify voices of already powerful artists that might not typically be, be accessed by our particular audience. And so I've been working on a, this project which will be launched probably in January because we want to do it really well. So we're taking our time. We're building a coalition in the community um, of BIPOC uh, artists and arts led uh, BIPOC led arts organizations to create this community committee, so to speak, that will move from, we're going to start with art that is um, sent in and we're giving people opportunity to say what they need to say without curation, without edits. And the, the idea is to engage at your own risk. Like these people need to be heard, what they're saying needs to be heard. And we get to utilize our ears, our brains, our hearts to engage with that in a powerful way. And, um, and then that coalition will, as things come in, There'll be the social media stuff. There'll be the, the media, the big media pushes as well into community activations, artist talkbacks, uh, hopefully some really good deep conversations. And one of our uh, board members, when we were talking about this, we came up with this phrase, Arts KC as a regional arts council, we could make a statement you know, like many people were making at the time about racism and, you know, a DEI and everything like that, or we could make a table, which is really what we want to do. We want to make a table to invite people to the conversation. So that's one thing. And um, the, how does that happen? Okay, so that's already five minutes. So there's lots of other things going on. The only other thing I wanted to say, seriously, how does that happen? It's like you go into this time warp. Um, is that uh, we are really concerned with resource sharing right now because of the, the, the lack of funding that's going on and going towards the arts community. Um, so I can tell you more about that if you want to reach out to me. Lisa can send out my contact information. There's stuff going on all over the state as well as the U.S. that we're plugged into and we'd love to share that with you. Great. Thank you, Anna Joy. And uh, yeah, I, I know this hour has kind of flown by and it's such so much great information by all of our presenters. I'm just going to spotlight me again. Actually, I think what I'm going to do is turn it into gallery view now and just kind of turn it over to questions. Um, so I'm going to put us all in gallery view. And Prasanna, I hope uh, I saw that you joined us 
um, I'm glad you were able to get in. So I'm, I'm glad you were here. And just a reminder, we will put this up on our uh, MU Extension Community Arts YouTube page. So this session, if you wanna revisit it or if you registered and, and maybe one of your friends wasn't able to join, we will have this up on our YouTube page. So we'll, we'll share that with everybody. Um, so I just wanna turn it over to any questions from the audience or thoughts or observations, or maybe one of the other panelists wants to comment on something else they heard in another presentation. And you guys are just welcome to unmute yourself and ask your questions, you don't. Right, and if you can't unmute yourself, just raise your hand and I'll make sure you're unmuted. Well, I'm gonna kick it off just so we're not sitting here staring at the screens. <laughs> Karen, I, I know you um, described your process but I think um, it would be nice to hear a little more about this hybrid model and how you contracted with this company to do video on demand. Because I think that's really interesting that you not only have live audience, but this virtual component. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think it was the key to really unlocking the artistry for people to enjoy it at home um, in a way that felt authentic, if you will, which is really ironic that it took filming it to make it feel like it was there mm -hmm. instead of actually being there. Um, and it wasn't really a company that we contracted. We were really lucky to um, identify a really gifted young film filmmaker who had his own equipment. And he was actually a friend of one of the actors in the show who also does a lot of camera work and um, was interested in it. And of course he was compensated for doing this. Um, but I, I have to really credit him. He had never filmed a play before. So he came in and you know studied the rehearsals, watched the play. And then I think what was really kind of interesting to me as a theater director, and usually as a theater director, you're really all about you know protecting your environment and keeping the space kind of in its own little bubble. And in this case, very much so. Um, but having him in the process um, was interesting he began to wear his big cameras like they're like a like a bodysuit kind of thing and um, be moving in space while rehearsal was going on so i think it was really critical that for us we were far enough along the way that that was not a distraction for us we were just doing our thing but it also gave me the chance to talk with him about some other angles that i thought might be some very cool shots once i saw what he was doing and that I knew the light cue coming from this angle will be really cool once it goes in. And his work then, um, and the consistency that he created, because of course theater's a malleable art, we're changing things all the way up to performance. So we had to kind of watch what he had captured on a certain day so we could make sure that we captured the same things the next time. So a couple things, we came back and reshot. You know, so that he could make sure that the floor, which had been painted, had caught up. So it wouldn't be disjointed for the audience. You know, that they saw it and like, the floor wouldn't like that a minute ago. So it was a really interesting experience. And of course, he's on my call list today because now having done this, I really want to do it for the shows we're doing this spring because we'll reopen in March. And I don't believe that I would want to proceed into this COVID environment without him. And of course, he's one of, of many, you know, film folk around, but I think his skills um, really kind of made it all come together in a way that we couldn't have done without him. Uh, and I would really encourage everybody to you know, check out who's doing film in your community. Um, him being really open to what we were making and also uh, understanding that we didn't want to make a movie we wanted to film a play, but we wanted to film a play in an artistically um, communicative way. That's a great distinction. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a comment in uh, from Beth, and I'll just read it for because some people are calling in. Um, PAA and can, Beth, can you remind us what PAA is in St. Joseph? Are you able to unmute? Um, there she goes. Arts Association. Yeah. Per okay. 
Performing Arts Association. Thank you. Right. Performing Arts Association in St. Joseph started doing live concerts during the month of October. We called it Arts on the Move and went out to different neighborhoods around St. Joseph using local artists and bands. We were able to sell sponsorships and even give artists and technical crew some money for participating. And I, I would say that that's, that's a great success story. Um, when you can you know, so many people are struggling with how are they going to survive, but if you're actually able to pay artists um, and build and cultivate community and strengthen your local art scene, I would say that's that's a real success story all around. And I think that's kind of been a common theme with all of the presenters today is that, um, you know, originally we had kind of envisioned this as technical tools, like how to use Zoom and lighting and, and that kind of thing. But I think there's a common theme that building community is one thing that you can do during this strange time. And, and you can use technology and creative ways to do that with some pretty outstanding results. I mean, all the money that was raised in some of these examples and the, you know, the reach that you're having, 11, 000, uh, I'm sorry, 1100 people voting, that's, those are successful measures. So are there others of you that um, listening in that would like to share their experiences or what concerns do you have? Uh, my name is Susan Adams. I'm director of Spiva Center for the Arts in Joplin. Uh, we've been around for about 75 years and Michael, I am so jealous. <laughs> Michael and I uh, and uh, are working on some projects together, but holy mackerel for you to your um, uh, take and make projects and, and those things, your results are so impressive. Um, we're really struggling uh, with our classes and we have offered take and make packages. Um, we generally have a pretty robust educational program, two or three classes on the weekend, uh, classes in the evenings. Um, but just, it, it was like uh, when school went back in, uh, mid to late August, all of the participation in our online and other peripheral things up, over and above the gallery just dried up. Uh, so I I'm just want to say how impressed you are, and I'd like to know what your magic, magic button was that you pushed, because it's not working for us right now as far as... Um, virtual or in-person uh, yeah. art classes? Hmm, I, I, I believe it's a blast. I mean, people are probably sick of us online, but uh, I mean, we also have a really well-developed kids list of like over five to 600 uh, kids in our community that we, you know, share information to. I don't know, making it easy. Um, thinking like normally we would have like a one-time pickup, but we offer lots of options now. Um, but we haven't, we've done no classes online whatsoever. Just the take and make, um, yeah, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, we have a community that's kind of a balance between, I mean, you guys are in a really serious area right now. Um, right. Han Hannibal is kind of a, a weird, we have, you know, Illinois on lockdown uh, based on regions. Um, so we have a lot of influx of people who are just ignoring everything that's going on. But I don't think our, our people, like our make and take, we handed out 60 projects on last Saturday night. And we weren't, on, wow. we weren't on the street handing them out. Those were people that are coming into our building because they knew they could come in to pick it up. Um, but we did a postcard to our kids list. We did a postcard to um, uh, our members. It, it's we've gone back to snail mail as well. Uh, just reconnect again. That that what is it? Um, the constellation of connection. Uh, we've really gone back to some snail mail to do a postcard. Just you know, it's not junk mail. Hopefully, if they're supporting us. <laughs> It's constantly communicating with our membership base so they know that where our struggles are, but also where our joys are. Well, we're, um, we were in the same situation as you were. Our uh, biggest event of the year is a 47-year uh, national photography competition. And we closed the day before 
SPIVA closed the day before the exhibit opened. So we were able to set up uh, virtual uh, gallery tours. Uh, and then when we, we reopened in early July, uh, you know, after the community lockdown, um, we were able to extend the show at additional time. So, and then we were able to move some exhibits around and now we're kind of back into our regular exhibit cycle, but we're requiring PPE and physical distancing. Um, we are going to be doing virtual exhibits. Uh, we found a, a pretty good platform that we can use. And then um, we're preparing for a huge exhibit in January, really uh, uh, an exciting different exhibit for, for Joplin. It's contemporary African-American art. We've been working on it since, um, oh, since last January. So it ended up being very, very timely, but we're trying to integrate um, as many different options because where we had anticipated people traveling from Tulsa and Northwest Arkansas and Kansas City uh, to see these nationally known artists, uh, it's just probably not gonna happen. So um, yeah, I, I think this has been a, a great presentation and it's been wonderful to hear from all the panel members. We, um, we offer we one-on-one offer -on -one gallery tours, like a talk mm -hmm. and tour with gallery staff and in some cases, again, that was social media that was getting it out there. And, and I can't say in, in some cases of designing programs during right now, whether two people did it or 25 or 100, it really doesn't matter. It's like showing your community that you're trying. Um, so just getting, again, sharing the graphic and, and getting it out there. Um, yes, we've had people do it, but even if they didn't, those observing us right now know that we're trying and we're doing our best. Yeah. So that's that's been really important. Katina, can I ask you a quick question? question before we um, come to a close? And there's another question in chat that I want to make sure we address too. So GK, go ahead and ask your question. Well, I just want to, as a digital media artist, um, how are you, especially during a time of COVID with such Zoom fatigue, driving people to your platforms? What are you doing to maintain this space since you already existed in the digital space and now it's kind of flooded by the rest of the world? Hmm. So what are we doing? Are you asking well, me? I'm asking Katina asking? particularly, but um, yep. anyone's welcome. Great, to good. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say just because, I mean, just because my work is digitally based didn't, doesn't mean that my work existed online, right? So even though, even though I make, you know, video and in digital art, it was still shown within the traditional four wall gallery context, right? Or it was still shown within like a film festival context. Um, so those, so, so those platforms are, were still very traditional, which my work was being shown in. So I think, you know, it's interesting because even though my work is, is digitally based, I mean, my work honestly, I would say, you know, like when you see those online exhibitions translates better online because it's already digitized whereas somebody who works in painting then has to take a digital photograph of their work to then you know and then that's what people see so i would say my work translates better to be online but how do i get that to i guess stand out um i mean honestly that's i don't i don't envy michael and those other of you who work in galleries because that's the gallerist's job to get my work out there um and to get their show promoted um so I don't, um, I mean, obviously, obviously Instagram, right? That's my number one. I mean, my, my personal number one tool. I always, if I'm in a show, I'll post it on Instagram, on my personal Instagram. Um, so, and I mean, people find me for shows on Instagram. I mean, Instagram has become so important these days, um, especially for contemporary artists. I mean, that's just like, yeah, hands out. I mean, and I mean, the one, the next time I'm doing this virtual thing, it's all going to be on Instagram live. So, um, so even like, so just, you know, keeping up with, I would say Instagram is like the number one thing that most people are using right now to promote and even show um, their works. Thank you, yeah. Katina. Our, our Instagram numbers have shot out the roof. I mean, yeah. it's still in the hundreds for us. It's not huge, but for us, it's big. Yeah. Hmm. 
That's that's good to know. We I want to make sure we get these questions in the chat. Diane is asking, are you willing to share the exhibit platform you are using? And I think that might have been directed towards Michael. Um, I think it was directed yeah. towards Sue. Oh, Sue maybe towards that. Sue. Okay, I'm sorry. And I um, absolutely, and I have just texted our staff person that set it up. We it's a free platform, which made it even more wonderful because we could get it up online quickly. It's not the best. Um, and we are looking at some other ones, but I've just texted our staff person. And how about I send that information to Lisa and, and that sure. way she can send it out to everybody. Sure, yes. And uh, I'll make sure, Diane, that we get you that information. Um, and then Tina asked, Karen, what platform do you stream your play on? And I'm reading these out because we have somebody calling in. And Karen responded, the video on demand was managed by Show Ticks for You, which has also created relationships with playwrights and licensing houses. So thank you for that tip. Tina, did you have a comment? I, I just think that's great. I was just wondering what uh, platform. Um, we uh, did a, a Shakespeare in the Park uh, virtual. It was recorded um, from last year and we just broadcast it this year and we didn't, we just, we had don off you know you could donate if you wanted to but it was not um it was not done with the intent of being um put out there you know as, like you said as as ex as an experience where it draws the audience in um so this is something i will probably be looking at for next year <laughs> so thank you for that suggestion <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that, that is the goal of these sessions is to plan and, and start thinking about tools you can use and strategies you can use to plan. So we are, you know, we're a little past one o'clock. If anybody needs to go, you know, we, we don't want to keep you all Zoom fatigued here. <laughs> but um, this is our last session in the series. I will be emailing everybody, all of you and all the other people who participated in other sessions, um, not only with links to view these sessions on our YouTube page, um, but also I'll be sending a survey around and we'd love to get your feedback. And one of the survey questions is what other topics would you like to see in a potential future series? I think there's some possibly some um, ideas about marketing or, um, you know, more technical issues like some of the very specific platforms. Um, but there's lots Maybe of other ideas. Fundraising or sharing fundraising. resources. Right. So we'd love to get your feedback. And I just want to thank all of our presenters today. I think this was a really great panel. You brought up um, lots of interesting food for thought. And um, it's really inspiring to see that there are successes happening in this kind of strange new world. And so it's, it's encouraging to see. And so um, unless there's any final thoughts, anybody wants to jump in and say anything, I would like to thank GK also for hosting this with me. And thank you all for joining. And um, once again, we'll send emails out to all of you to follow up. So thank you so much for taking your time out. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good week, everybody.